Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The Bible teaches that God's ways are not our ways and His thoughts are not our thoughts. In other words, there is a disconnect between humanity and God. And what we learn is that it's only by means of redemption, only after receiving the Holy Spirit within our life, then and only then do we have the potential to hear from God and the power to obey Him. Now, we are in the midst of our study of the book of Genesis. We ended last week in chapter 4 and verse 7. I want to pick up in that same location. So if you have your Bibles, and I trust you do, that you would look there with me to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. Now, to comprehend what is being revealed to us in this passage, we need to remember something that the first man and the first woman sinned in the garden. And they, as an outcome, understood their guiltiness before God. And they tried to respond to that sin by covering up their shame. In the scripture, we use that word nakedness. And they did so by sewing together fig leaves. But we find later on, and we talked about this, that God saw that as inadequate, insufficient. And he used the skins of animals. Now, why is that important? Well, in order to get those skins, there was the shedding of blood. So we see a principle. We see the shedding of blood as a requirement for the covering of our guilt. Now, covering is known as atonement. But there's something better than atonement, and that is redemption. Redemption totally removes the guilt, whereby atonement only covers it, and it keeps God's judgment at a distance, but it does not remove the need for God's judgment. That's something that we need to remember throughout our study of the book of Genesis, because that principle is is taught and dealt with over and over. So we see in this passage of Scripture that that Cain is displeased. He's displeased because his offering did not contain blood. They were not from a living being, but rather from vegetation. And God did not receive that. And we use that expression, his countenance, literally his face fell. He was disappointed. He was dejected. And instead of seeing what change he could bring in his life to be pleasing to God so that he would be acceptable to God, what did he do? Well, remember, sin is at work in creation because of that first sin of Adam ve Chava, Adam and Eve. And we see that pride and jealousy and a desire to, to outdo others, all of those things are now alive and functioning in the life of Cain. And why is that vital for us to understand that? We need to see those things as a consequence of sin. And if we don't deal with sin properly, well, it's going to manifest itself in a unpleasing and disastrous fashion. Why do I say that? Well, look, if you would, to verse verse 7. God is speaking to Cain and his displeasure and dejection from being rejected by God. And God says, surely if you do good. Now, the word here is the word good, but in a verb form. So if you do what is good. Now, some Bibles translates it, and there's nothing wrong with that, with the word right. 
But it's not the word right as in righteous or proper. It's the word good. And we've learned several times that the concept of good, biblically speaking, is related to the will of God. So it might be better to us to translate it if you do the will. If you do God's will, something's going to come about. He says, sa'et. Sa'et is the word to lift up, or in this case, to receive, to be received or to be taken. So what God is saying is, if you do my will, I will receive you. I will accept your offering. But if not, he says, but if you do not do good, if you do not do my will, he says, then, and here's the outcome. And before we look at the outcome, we can say something. There's always going to be an outcome, regardless of what we do right or what we do wrong. There's always an outcome. God is a responsive God. He's never ignoring. He is going to respond. So he says, if you do what is wrong, if you don't do my will, if you don't do good, at the door, sin. And the word for, for lying at your door is a word for, same word we see in the book of Psalms in Psalm 23, where it says he makes us to lie down in green pastures. So it's, it's positioned. But here, sin is being positioned where it can successfully come against us. So when you do that which is against God's will, it positions sin against us so that it can carry out its desire rather than the desires of God. So if you do that which is against my will, which is not good, sin is, is crouching, it's lying at the door, and unto you is its desire, its passion. Now, we've looked at this word before, and it's a strong desire. What we find, what we learn is that sin has a desire for us. Sin wants to find us. Sin wants to move in our life, in our being, in our existence, in our behavior. And here's the problem. When we do what is in God's will, it positions sin at a distance. But when we do what is against God's will, then it positions sin in our life where it can, can work against us. And we're going to see that. Now, the last part of this verse is so important. It says, bo. It's the word for rule. We talked about this word relating to government. So what we could say is, but you must learn to have authority over it. You must learn to rule it. And how do we do that? Well, the answer is what we're going to see because moving into this, this next section, the second half of chapter 4, we're going to see that there is an emphasis in the text on blood, dealing with blood properly. Now, the problem is that Cain did not. He shed blood improperly. And we're going to see an image of that in no uncertain terms. So I want to underscore before we move on to our new verse today, verse 8, that we must learn to rule, to master, to govern, to have authority over sin. And the only way to do that is through the power of redemption, verse 8. And Cain spoke to Hevel, that is his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Hevel, his brother, and he killed him. Now, what do we see? We see that, that Cain is angry. He just doesn't have pride and jealousy. He's not only dejected and feels rejected by God, but he takes it out not at the real problem, but really an innocent person and that is his brother. His brother did what was right. And instead of him, that is kind, repenting and learning from that, no, he in his anger, now here's the key, you know, jealousy, pride, 
these feelings that we ought not to have. If we don't rule over sin, they are going to attack us. They are going to have a desire for us. And what is that? Well, we're going to see that there is an inherent relationship between sin and Satan. And therefore, when we do not rule over sin, when we do not do good, it is, and we've learned this over and over, it is an invitation for sin, that is, the power of the enemy, the devil, to come into our life and for us to be used by him rather than us being a faithful vessel to accomplish the will of God. So we read here that Cain rose up against his brother Hevel and he killed him. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Cain, immediately after this act of murder, God spoke. Now, God knows everything. Nothing takes him by surprise. God doesn't have to ask any questions. So when he does, it's not for his benefit, but there's a additional purpose. He speaks to Cain. So God knows about his sin. God could have, have stopped it, but... That would not be the world, the fallen world that we're living in. This fallen world has the ability to do that which is against God's will. And that does not in any way attack his sovereignty. The sovereign God allows for sin. He doesn't cause sin. His will is not uh, uh, moved forward because of sin. Meaning this, God's will is best achieved through obedience, through his program. But because someone's sin does not mean that it's going to defeat God's purposes and plans from being ultimately fulfilled. But the one who sin is not going to benefit from that. That's the key. God can use sin, but he prefers to use obedience. He leads, he calls, his will is always for the obedience of his, his word, not for disobeying his word. But even when we disobey, it is not going to mean ultimately, and that's a key word, ultimately, that God's will is not going to be accomplished. So God speaks to, to Cain here and he says, where is Hevel, your brother? Now, being emphasized in this passage is this relationship between Cain and Hevel. They are brothers. And therefore, there should have been an intimacy. There should have been a friendship. There should have been that kindred spirit. But because of sin, what do we find? We find the family being destroyed. This union that God created is being attacked by sin. And so... God speaks and says, where is Hevel, your brother? And Cain's going to respond, and he's going to say here that he does not know. He says, I do not know. So he lies. So we're seeing a manifestation of the character of sin. We're seeing what happens when son, someone does not master and rule over sin. What happens? Well, we see the first sin taking place in the garden, that disobedience of eating that fruit that God commanded that man not partake of. Because of that, there is a wrong way of thinking. There is jealousy. There is pride. There is the inability to respond to the emotion correctly. Instead of saying, you know, I'm dejected. Well, why are you dejected? Because you did not do what is right. So what's the solution of being dejected, having your countenance fall? Repent and do what is good. That's what God says in verse 7. And in doing so, repentance is going to teach you to rule over sin. But when we don't, we're going to allow those feelings of jealousy and pride and being dejected. We're going to see that they're going to manifest in not just a wrong way of thinking, but wrong behavior. And that's what Cain did. He killed, murdered his brother. And now we find to cover that up, he lies. Now, lying to God reveals that we really don't know much about him because you can't lie to one who is all-knowing. So he says, I do not know. And then it even gets worse because he goes on and says, am I my brother's keeper? 
Well, God's will would be that we are looking after one another, that we are someone who watch and guards for other people. But here again, there's a, a degree of, of just rudeness, of insolence in, in Cain's voice. He says to God, am I my brother's keeper? Do you expect me to know where he is all the time and to, to deal with that and to behave in that way and to look over him? So he's being rude and offensive to God. And that is another outcome of sin ruling in our life rather than us ruling over sin. Verse, verse 10. And God is speaking here. It says, and he says, what have you done? Now here again, God knows, but he's calling to kind his sin. He's making known to him that he knows what he, has, what he has done. He says, what have you done for the voice of the blood of your brother? And most Bibles say, cry out. That would be the word uh, uh, bochim. But here it's not the word lifkot, to cry, but it's the word litzok. And here this passage, it's soakim. What is that? To scream out. To yell always when that word is used. It is in regard to yelling or screaming, making a great noise. So it's not weeping as in sadness, but it's screaming as in horror or something that is extremely problematic. So he says, your brother's blood, and blood here is in the plural, cries out unto me from the ground. Now, ground is synonymous with, with man. That word man, Adam, comes from the word ground, Adama. And what he's saying here is that the blood cries out in regard to the attack against humanity or man or ground. It's a play on words. So there is a response, in other words, from the earth. Now, why is that? Well, remember, Paul teaches in the book of Romans that because of sin, the earth groans and moans. This is what we see here. So it's groaning and moaning because as a result or an outcome of man's sin, this world is in decay. This world, world, world is going through a negative, a negative consequence. So just like sin will have an effect in my life, when a person sin, what happens? Well, the original sin brought about death, brought about this aging and decaying process. It brought mortality to humanity. In that same way, it brings those negative features to earth. Now, here's what's interesting. Today, you hear so much uh, global warming or climate change or uh, Earth Day and all these things in regard to the well-being and humanity's responsibility to Earth. Now, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with that. We should be good stewards of the creation that God has provided. But, but don't miss on the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not what we're doing to cause problems, pollutions and such to the earth. No, the greater problem that is causing the earth to decay is the abundancy of sin. What the scripture is saying to us is that sin affects the world, this earth, God's creation. So it's very problematic when people only think about one aspect. The greatest culprit against this planet is the sins of man. We find that it doesn't say that the earth cries out okay, because of the, the pollution, the, the global warming. No, it cries out because of the shed blood, because of a description of a sin. Verse, verse 11. And now, that is, as an outcome of this, God is still speaking to Cain because of his sin. And the earth is, is reflecting that and proclaiming that. He says, and now cursed are you 
from the earth. Here, he's talking about a change of location, but notice this word cursed. If you go back to the previous chapter, chapter 3, and look at what God says to the serpent, because the serpent tempted that woman, because the serpent was the source of sin, what do we know? God says that he cursed the serpent. The serpent became a curse. So the same word is used in order to show the connection, how Satan is in this, this passage as well, in bringing about sin. And the same consequence that was placed upon the serpent is now placed upon kind. He says, now cursed are you from the ground which open up its mouth to receive the blood of your brother from your hand. So the earth gets it right. The earth receives that blood which, which kind shed. And it shows a disconnect. We can learn from the earth. The earth cries out. The earth wants the outcome of redemption. Now, where is the outcome of redemption? In the kingdom of God. We know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Great. That's a synonymous expression with the establishment of the new Jerusalem, the final form of the kingdom. So the earth today, we, we don't hear it with our ears but the earth cries out for redemption, the outcome of redemption, the kingdom. Let me ask you, is, is, is that an de accurate description of you? Do you cry out for redemption? Do you want to see the outcome, the kingdom, uh, to be a reality? Most humans don't. Most believers don't. We are too involved in this world, and the world knows it's fallen. It's going to, to be destroyed. And a new earth and a new heaven's going to be formed. That's what the world wants, if only we did as well. So look at verse 12. For you shall work the ground. Now, in one sense, this is a new revelation. We see in the garden, God commanded Adam to work the ground. We see that as well in chapter 3. As a consequence of sin, he's going to work the ground. But the ground's going to be very different. Previously, the earth was, was an incubator for fruitfulness. Things spread up. So when he was called to work the ground, it was mostly a pruning, meaning taking away the fruit, bringing order to it. But, but now, because of sin, you're going to have to sow and reap. You're going to have to worry about the ground's condition. There's going to be famines. There's going to be droughts and such. And also, we see something else. Notice very important truth. Verse, verse 11, at the end it says, and the earth is not going to continue to give its koach. Koach is power to you. So what's happening is this. There's a change. Previously, just think about how massive the earth is. We see many things that display the power, what the world would call Mother Nature. I mean, it is a strong earth. We see volcanoes, we see powerful waves, we see storms, many things that the earth can do that manifest its power. Previously, that power was going to be harnessed and utilized by us. But now, many times, the earth is working against us. The power is not going to be for us, but against us. And we're going to try to have to utilize with much work, and much effort to benefit. The second thing that we can drive is that there's going to be a decrease in the, the nutrients, we might say, of the earth. And we see that. Instead of the earth being just constantly giving and providing, we see that there's a decay. Sometimes we have to let the earth rest. Sometimes we have to sow other places, and sometimes we have to put fertilizers and different things, uh, chemicals, so the earth will give its yield. 
So all of what the scripture is describing about the earth as a consequence of sin is true today. Science is trying to, to reverse that, but uh, it doesn't do so very well. Verse 12. Now a personal outcome in regard to kind sin. He says, na ve nad. Two words that are similar. The first word can mean to, to shake or to wave or to move. So what it's saying here is that as a consequence of that sin, kind is going to have to move and the next word, nod, is a word for wander. He's going to have to go wander from place to place. So he's moving. What is that to depict? Well, the sages say there's not going to be stability. He's not going to find what he's looking for in his location. So he's going to move from one thing to another, from one location to another, trying to find what, what he's seeking. He's going to be living a life of instability. So he says a mover and a wanderer. You shall be in the earth. Verse 13. And kind said to the Lord, uh, Great is my iniquity from bearing. Too great. He says, This punishment is basically more than I can bear. And you know what? He's right. Because in the end, the punishment is going to bring about death. He's not going to find the solution. In the earth. Now, that solution, well, we're going to see a foretaste, a, a description, a hint before we conclude this study today. But he's right. He's not going to find redemption in his life. Verse 14 Behold, you have cast me out this day from upon the, the earth. Now, what he's saying about God is this. In the end, I'm leaving this planet. I, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be here for eternity. I'm going to another location. And he's right. Ultimately, he's going to go where? He's going to go to Sheol. So all of this is to give us revelation about the, the destiny of man without redemption. We're going to leave this planet. Now, why is that important? Well, when we go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we find that the world was created, I'm speaking primarily of the earth, for our provision. We see there's a connection between creation and life. So he's leaving this creation where God had placed them. And ultimately, first the garden and in this place that he was thereafter. He's being banished from this world, this earth, and he knows the disasters. He knows the, the, the disaster that that means for him eternally. So he says, you have cast me today from the face of the land or the ground, and before you I will hide, it's this word conceal, my face. So he says here, I will be hidden from before your face. I'm not going to have intimacy with you. I'm not going to have a relationship with you. For I'm going to be a mover and a wonder in the earth. I'm not I'm going to be looking for God and I'm not going to find him. I'm going to be seeking him, moving from place to place, and once again, he's not going to be with me. Now look at verse, verse 15. And it comes about, he's still speaking kind, and it shall come about, all who finds me will kill me. Now he's saying here is that others, and we're talking about the fa family of Adam Bechava, Adam and Eve. Now it is reasonable, much time is elapsing, that they're having other children. And therefore, he says, I have given a visible description, an outcome of sin. I have killed. And notice the outcome of that. 
and he says because of that they're going to want retribution they're going to want vengeance now why do i use that word because that word is going to appear several times in the text this killing is a a retribution an eye for an eye that's what they're going to want and this is not god's desire this is not right to have vengeance that's not what humanity is supposed to have now someone's going to say now wait a second uh the torah says that there's going to be an eye for an eye the torah allows for for capital punishment that is right but that is in the torah that comes later here god is trying to teach us a better way you say there's a better way than the torah absolutely one of the aspects of the torah now that does not mean that the torah is not good and holy and righteous but it means something see the torah is not eternal i realize that judaism teaches that it is but the bible does not why do i say that well one of the necessities of the torah ultimately is the the temple now previously when they were were traveling in the wilderness in the desert and while they were initially in the land of israel for approximately 400 years and plus there was the mishkan the tabernacle but ultimately as i said it became the temple and there is and you can look at the book of hebrews to to understand this there is that relationship between the temple and the torah they go hand in hand when there's no temple it makes doing literally the torah an impossibility and we know in the new jerusalem there's not going to be a temple so the torah is not eternal one of the purposes of the torah was to drive us to faith who had faith abraham that's why god made a covenant with him and this covenant rested in the work the redemptive work of messiah i point often and frequently to galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. so the torah one of its purposes is to drive us back to faith god's original purposes so when someone sin god wants that person to die no that's the outcome of sin but god doesn't want it and we're going to see that what does god want god delights not in the consequence of sin god delights in repentance so that he can forgive and the only way that he can forgive is through redemption now this is all going to be hinted to in this passage so once more look if you would to verse 15 and the lord spoke to him therefore all who kills kind at seven shiva time it says here sevenfold he will be uh placed vengeance will be placed upon him sevenfold that's probably the best way to translate that remember that because that's going to come in to play here we have a situation where kind a murderer if someone kills him sevenfold vengeance from god is going to be placed upon him that means it's not God's will for someone to, to give retribution to, to kill Cain. It's not God's will, even though Cain is a murderer. What is this hinting to? Redemption as a removal of our sin guilt. That's what he's trying to teach us. And the Lord placed upon Cain an oath. That is a mark but this is also the word for a sign or a miracle but here's the key i believe we talked about this earlier on in our study of the book of genesis the word oat is a miraculous sign that only god can do so god is going to put a mark miraculously upon kind that does something look again and the lord placed upon kind a mark and then he uses the word le vilti hakot making it impossible to strike him to give him blows so th uh, for who for all who find him meaning that there is an expansiveness to this no one anyone who finds him 
Anyone who's bothered by that and thinks about retribution and vengeance, God says, no, you're not going to be able to place it upon kind. Why? Because God does not want a chain reaction to sin. God does not delight in my sin bringing about another sin. I sin against you, you sin against me, you sin against someone else, and we see just more sin giving birth to more sin. That's not what God wants. God does not want retribution. He wants redemption. And that's what this passage is going to teach us in a moment. Look now to verse 16. And Cain went out from before the Lord, and he dwelt in the land of Nod. The word Nod comes from that same word, which means to wander. So God says, you're going to move and wander, and he goes and he lives in the land of wandering. Here again, no stability. What is it trying to teach us? When we don't have intimacy with God, when we leave God, we're going to have instability in our life. We're going to be moving from one place to another, and therefore it says he dwells in the land of, of Nod or node in this case, which is east of Eden. East is frequently associated with God's judgment. So he's experiencing not Eden, but he's receiving the, the judgment instead of Eden, which is paradise. Eden comes from a word which means uh, pleasure or, or that which uh, is adorning, beautiful. Verse, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife. Now, people will say, well, where did this woman come from? Well, this would be his sister. People say, well, that's a violation of the Torah. At this time, the Torah is not in force. Therefore, the Torah had not been given. And we don't see a problem with Cain having relations with his sister. The, the statement is to be fruitful and multiply. So here... Even though he's a sinner, he is going to be now attempting to, to bring about God's will, obey God. He says that he goes out from before the Lord. He dwells in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bared Hanok. Now, Hanok is his son, and it says, and it came about, he builds a city. Who's the, the subject of that verb? Well, from the context, it's once again kind. He has a family, so he's building a city. He's building a place for his family to, to inhabit. And what does he call it? He calls the name of the city as the name of his son, Hanok. So here we find progression. He is concerned about his offspring. He is concerned about his son having a place to dwell. Now, he's showing things having to do with God's purposes and plans. God's concern about where we dwell. God provides. So these things are being exemplified through kind. And, and likewise, we find in verse 18... And it was given birth to Hanok, Irad. And Irad gave birth to Mehu Yael. And Mechi Yael gave birth to Metush Shael. So I don't know how significant it is, but in the Hebrew, you don't see this in English. The one who was born to Irad was called first Mehu Yael. But Mechiael gave birth to Metushel. There's a change in enunciation, how that name is written. Now, what can we glean from that? Well, a very important principle. And that is frequently the same person is called by different names. Sometimes the names are similar. Sometimes they are very, very different. As in the case of, of Yitro or Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, he has uh, two additional names. So names can be altered. Names can be changed for reasons. Well, what else do we find here? 
Well, we find that that this one, Mechiael, gave birth to Metushael, and Metushael gave birth to Lamech. Now, we're seeing a progression and many generations happening, but there's still more of the family that we don't know about. And what we're going to see is that Adam and Chava are still having children beyond what their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are doing. Why? What is God's will? That the earth be full. That this family be fruitful and multiply, and we are seeing an example of that. Well, look now to verse 19. And he took, we're talking about Lamech, he took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second is Sila. Now, we find that man is improvising in a way that goes beyond God's instruction. What do I mean by that? God created one woman for one man. That's what God did in creating Chava for Adam. But now, Lamech, he's taking two wives. If you look at the rabbinical commentary on this, you'll find this is the ways of the nations, not the ways of God's people. So we see a problem. He took two wives, and we have their names. Look now to verse 20. And Ada gave birth to Yaval, and he was the father of the one who dwells in tents and has cattle, or a herd, we could say. So this is the first one, and the word here for tent, ohel, has to do with a temporary structure. Instead of, like we saw earlier, with one dwelling in a city. Remember what, what Kain did? He built a city for Hanok, for this family. But now, as a consequence, remember, two wives. We see instead of staying in one place, as Hanok was going to do, we find that he's now dwelling in tents and moving. We learn that is a consequence of sin. So it's just trying to educate us and illustrate that for the reader. He dwells in tents and he is utilizing herding. He is doing this as a profession. Now you say, well, wasn't Hevel doing that? That's true. But the ideal here is that instead of doing it in order to offer to God, he's doing it as a means of work. He's selling. When this word is used here, it's talking about a profession. We were supposed to have, have authority over the animal world for responsibility, to care for them. They were what? Well, what we see is that still vegetation, the, the fruit of trees and plants and vegetation were for us. But now it depicts something different, that animals are going to be sold and it foreshadows a profession. This is very vital. We'll come back to that in the weeks to come. Well, we read on. And in verse 21, the name of his brother was Yuval, and he was the father of all who takes the kinor and unnag. These are musical instruments. So now we see not only a profession as a herdsman, but also we see musician. We see, some have said, work and pleasure. Work and relaxation coming into creation. And then verse 22, And Sila, also she gave birth to Tuval Kain, and he was a sharpener of all the things that are our form of brass and iron. So now we see, going way far back, that there was this sharpening or forging, shaping is another word we could use, of both cop, uh, copper or brass and iron. And his sisters of Tuval Kain, his sister was Naamah. So now we see not only brothers but sisters coming into play. 
Obviously, that's where this, these women are coming from. So it's progressive revelation showing us something. It says, Ve'achot, his sister, was Tuval Kain. I translated it improperly in the plural. It's actually in the singular. And it was Nama, verse 23. And Lamech, here again, a different enunciation of his name, said to his wives, Ada and Selah, Listen to my voice, the wi- O wives of Lamech, and give ear to my words, for a man I have killed. So now he's killed someone. Well, is that what Kind did? Well, it's different. He says, I killed because he wounded me. And a young man, or yell at a child, it's uh, unsure, most English translations say, a young man who has bruised me. So he's saying, I've done the same thing, but I did it for a different reason, in self-defense, because he was wounding and bruising me. I, I defended myself. And he says, in this case, for if sevenfold, kind will be vindicated. He says, and Lamech, for Lamech, it's going to be 70 times seven. So what we're learning here is this. That if God did not make retribution, allowed someone to judge kind for killing, and if he did, sevenfold would be placed upon him. Now, as of self-defense, if someone, because someone kills another due to self-offense, there's going to be more vengeance. So God doesn't want any killing, but he does not want retribution upon those who have sinned. Why? Because this retribution would bring an end. What God's interested is in redemption. Now look at verse 25. Verse 25 gives us the hint of redemption in the words that are used here. Why do I say that? Well, verse 25. And Adam, that is that first man, Adam, he knew again his wife. Now, Is this the next time that he, after Cain and Abel, the next time he knew his wife? No. But what is being revealed here is a continuation of God's plans and purposes. It says, he knew again his wife, and she gave birth to a son. And you shall call his name, it says here, Shet. Now, why Shet? Because for shot li Elohim, for God has provided, he has given, he has placed to me, and notice this, Zerah Acher. Zerah is literally a seed or an offspring. In this case, because it's masculine, it's another son. And this son is going to illustrate something. It is going to reveal to us an important biblical truth. And what is that? Well, the context here is in place of. There's a substitute. And substitution is key in redemption. Why do I say that? Because you didn't die upon the cross. Messiah did. You should have died upon the cross. You should have suffered the penalty ultimately of sin. But you didn't. Or you don't have to because of God's provision. So God provided Shet, a son, a Zerah, a different son for Hevel because Cain killed him. So we see here in the biblical language, God purposely saying, here's a solution. I'm going to provide a solution for this outcome of sin. That's what God is speaking about. Look, if you would, to verse 26. And to set also there was born a son. And called he called his name Enosh. Enosh is a word that is related to Messiah. In fact, the two words, Zerah and Enosh, are related to Messiah. Because the word Zerah, If we say the word Zeroah, just a different form of the same word, we learn something. 
we learned that Zoroah is tied to the Passover sacrifice. That's one of the ways that we call the Passover sacrifice. And Enosh is what Daniel calls, uses the term Ben Enosh, the son of man. So these words hint to Messiah in the text. And it says, Then hu chal likro b'shem Adonai. What does it mean here? Because of this passage dealing with the birth of Shet and the birth of the second one, Enosh, we find that there was a change. Then man began, literally, he was made to begin to call upon the name of the Lord. And this calling on the name of the Lord relates to worship. It also is a phrase that we find in Joel where it says, when the sun turns black and the moon turns to blood, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That is, respond to Messiah. Respond to God's provision. And that's what this is hinting to. God has provided a seed, a seed of man. That's what Zerah Enosh means, the seed of man. And what is this seed of man going to do? Well, he is a substitute for the first Adam. Why the first Adam? The first Adam brought sin. The second Adam is going to bring redemption. So all of this is being hinted at in the text. A remez, that is a word, a clue. Remez is the Hebrew word for clue or hint. It is a hint to what God's going to do in bringing about his plan of redemption. See, throughout the book of Genesis, we see over and over how God moves to reveal what he wants to do, and that is to bring redemption into your life and my life through Zerah Acher, a different seed. See, the seed of Adam was polluted by sin, and that's why Zerah Avraham, the seed of Abraham, Messiah, is going to come into this world uniquely. He is going to be conceived not by the seed of man, but by the Holy Spirit, so that he can bring about the outcome of redemption. Well, we'll stop with that until next week when we begin chapter 5. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to our next installment. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>